The birth of the English started in the 5th century. Now during the 5th century, Britain, as it was known then, not England at all, hadn't come into existence then, Britain was occupied by the Romans. And in the 5th century, due to the problems back in Rome, they left, leaving behind the Britons speaking a language that is very similar to Welsh and Cornish today, Brythonic. There are a few place names and river names in Suffolk that still have those Brythonic names. Um, Clare, the River Stour. Right, so there's a few Brythonic names left. Now the English arrived and these were four tribes. You had mainly the Angles and the first Angles to settle they created a kingdom called the East Angles. Now the Angles came from Jutland, from a place called Angolan. And the reason why it was called Angolan is because there was a peninsula shaped like a fish hook. And their name for a fish hook was Angle. And that's why when you go fishing, you're going angling because you've got an angle on the end rather than a hook, right? So the East Angles were then formed. Now the first place they settled um, was I Ipswich, as we know, and they called it Ipswich. They then went up the River Deben, which is Anglo-Saxon for Deep One, and then they set up camp at Coison, um, which translates as Kingstown, which is now part of Woodbridge, and also at Rendlesham. When the kings died, they went across the River Deben and buried them at Sutton Hoo which is Anglo-Saxon South Tunnel Hall, which means South Farm on the hillside, on the slope, right? The East Angles is present day Suffolk, Norfolk and Cambridgeshire. Those south of the River Waveney and the River Little Ouse were known as the South Folk, and north of the River Waveney and north of the Little Ouse was known as the Nord Folk the Norfolk, the Norfolk. So that's how we get Suffolk and Norfolk. The Saxons came in and they left their homeland, which was Schleswig Holstein, present day Schleswig Holstein. The vast majority of Saxons, so-called because they had a short sword, fighting sword called a Siax, so they were known as the Siaxons. Right. The Saxons went south from Schleswig Holstein, took over a big area, and that area was named after them, Saxony. They came over here as well, and the area that they took over was also named after them. The East Saxons, the Middle Saxons, the West Saxons, and the South Saxons, which eventually became known as the Essex, the Middle Sax, the West Sax, and the Sud Sax, which is present day Essex, Sussex, Middlesex, and of course Wessex. The Jutes came from Jutland and they settled in present day Kent, well half of Kent, along the south coast, Isle of Wight and half of present day Hampshire. The Frisians came from North Netherlands and the Frisian Islands and they came in mainly with the East Angles and the Jutes. And we have place names in Suffolk, the East Angles, um, that are representing the Frisians. Friston. Freston and we even have a Frisian Fjelda which is Freshenfield. So that's where the Frisians settled, right? They all spoke the same language but a different dialect. And after the East Angles, then more Angles arrived, and then we had the Middle Angles, which was from the East Angles to the present day Welsh border. North of those two, we then had Mercia and Lindsay, present day Lincolnshire. And then north of that, we had Northumbria going all the way up to Edinburgh. Edinburgh was part of the Angle Territory Kingdom, Northumbria. They started to fight one another and the Middle Angles were taken over by Mercia and Lindsay swapped hands between Northumbria and Mercia. East Angles were also taken over by Mercia and then back again. So there's lots of fighting going on. Right now, But they all spoke the same language. Angles, Jutes, Frisian, but they were known later on as the English, because the Angles were the biggest invading force by far, going from Sudbury on the 
East Saxon Essex border, Suffolk, right the way up to Edinburgh. And eventually that became the Anglo part of Anglo-Saxon, but that word hasn't come into existence yet, right? The Britons were overrun and they became strangers in their own country. And the old English word for stranger is Walish. So lots and lots of Britons were pushed over to the west and that big area on the side of England became known as Walish, present day Wales. The ancient kingdom of Kern became known as Kern Walish, Cornwallis, Cornwall. Lots of Britons thought, blow this and we're going to emigrate. And they went to northern France and the area that they took over eventually became known as Brittany. That's how Brittany gets its name. Originally it was Britannia and by the Normans and we were Britannia and then in the 1200s Geoffrey de Monmouth thought we've got to distinguish between these two so he kept Britannia as Britannia and the other Britannia became Grand Britannia. Great Britain. That's how we get Great Britain. And anyway, so early Old English, the language is now forming. The English language is now forming and early Old English would be gestern Daig, Daid there, the way's good. To Daig, storm up Aris, mit Regen and Hegelscher, wie hidden under them Hegwagen. Now you're going to be under, you're going to understand that later on. Okay. I can assure you that. <laughs> I really do. Right, so that is early Old English. And we've got the Wuffingers were the ruling classes of the East Angles. Now the Wuffingers means the wolf tribe or the followers of a leader called Wolf. Now, Wolf was a nickname given to a, a warrior, a prestigious warrior. Um, Wolf, Wolfgard became Woolard. Wolfhelm wore a helmet with a wolf on that went into battle. He led the troops. He became known Wilhelm and eventually William. So lots and lots of names with Wolf in it. And so these were the lead. Now, they were an offshoot from the Swedish royal family and they settled in Angolan and then became the kings of the East Angles. Um, got lots of English place names due to the, the Angle invasion. We're here at Edwardston, Edwardston, down the road as Boxford. And there's a lovely place just down the road on the way to Bury called Alfeton. And that means the estate of the royal beauty. Um, ton being farmland or an estate and Alfit means noble beauty and one of the very few places that was owned by a female. Um, all the Stokes meaning a little hamlet outside the main village. Toy which is peculiar to Suffolk that was common ground for grazing for people that were passing through. The Lee meaning sort of a meadow, so lots and lots of Anglo-Saxon or Old English words in our place names. In Woodbridge it was called Kingston or Kyson, it was Old English, Kennington, meaning the King's Estate or Royal Manor, right? And also you've got Kyson Hill and Kyson Point, which is abbreviated forms of Kingston Hill and Kingston Point, and you've also got Kyson Who. So in Woodbridge, so you can see there's lots and lots of that. And also we've got lots of Old English words in the Suffolk dialect. Boar, here you go Well, it depends on what part of Suffolk you come from. This part of Suffolk, it's mine here you go When you get Barry Sedmans, it's mine here you go Stowmarket, Needham, it's mine here you go And when you get East Suffolk, it's boar. And in Norfolk, it becomes boar. And that's pure Anglo-Saxon for somebody who tills the soil, a peasant farmer, and a small holding farmer. And also in Suffolk we don't say nearly, we say it's nigh on 11 o'clock, um, there's nigh on 15 of them, right, the end is nigh, and grandmother used to say nigh nigh boy for near boy. So if you have a small holding farmer, or somebody who tills the soil, who lives next door to you, he becomes your neighbour, which is the English word for neighbour. And some people also think that boar is also a shortened version of neighbour. That lanya 
Now, Lahn is pure Anglo-Saxon. Laren, the German word today is Lehren, and it means to teach. So therefore, when we say that Lahn, yeah, we're saying that will teach you and not that will learn you. On the her, her is an Anglo-Saxon word, H-O-H, -H, ho, meaning on the slant. And also where you see places like Colfo, um, Dallinghu, Suttonhu, comes from the word hall on a slanting hill slope. Airy wiggle is the Suffolk word for an earwig, and that's where the English get the word earwig from, airy wiggle. Polly wiggle is a tadpole, pole meaning head, and wiggle, so it's a head with a wiggle. <laughs> a lovely description of a tadpole. So you can see there's, there's words in there. And also, our pronunciation, the Suffolk pronunciation, especially the double syllable, is going back to Anglo-Saxon times. It's the Anglo pronunciations. So, S-T-E-O-R, steel, is the English word today, steer, right? Well, we say steer, goes back. Tagle, with a G, but the G was also pronounced as a Y sound which I'm going to go into later, and it becomes tail. So tail becomes tail, and it's what the dog wags when it's pleased to see you, tail. You can see the Suffolk dialect coming in there. R-E-G-N, Reagan. The Germans pronounce it as Reagan today, but change the G to a Y, and you get Reagan. And we've had plenty of that lately. <laughs> yeah, Reagan. So you can hear that Suffolk double syllable coming in there. We then had the Vikings arrive in the 8th century. Now, this, they had a massive effect on the English language, and it's only now really being recognised by scholars. Um, the Vikings helped to streamline the English language to what it is today. They really did. Now, in early Anglo-Saxon, or Old English, we must call it Old English, really, because Old English also includes Old Norse. Anglo-Saxon doesn't recognise the Viking element. So, in early Old English, you had male nouns, female nouns, neutral, and you had strong nouns, and you had weak nouns. Now, all the adjectives that went with them all had to be spelt different, dependent on whether it was a strong vowel, a strong noun, a weak noun, neutral, female, or male. Now, the Danes, Right, the Vikings, when they arrived, they spoke the same language as the Anglo-Saxons, Jutes and Frisians, but a different dialect. And so they went to no interpreters yet until when the Normans arrived. So they take the language down to the lowest common denominator so they can understand one another. So we ended up with the, and everything was, so you had female table, male chairs, female house, female boat, male this, male that, strong noun, this, strong that. Because of the Danes, we had the. And we just kept the noun exactly the same spelling and didn't have to change it. And when I give my talks in the schools, the kids all say, thank you, Danes. <laughs> Absolutely right. Also, the way of um, plurals, right? You could add, dependent on whether it's a strong noun, weak noun, neutral, male or female, you can add an ES on the end, S-A-U-E-N-N. Lots and lots of ways of making the plural. But because of the Danes, we mainly added ES and S on the end and made it simpler. Right, this is a leftover, right, with today's plurals. And you can see that we've still got leftovers of the Danish and Old English and Anglo-Saxon mix, we really have. We'll begin with the box and the plural as boxes. But the plural of ox becomes oxen, not oxes. One fowl is a goose and two are called geese, yet the plural of moose should never be meese. You may find a mouse in a nest full of mice, yet the plural of house is houses, not hoice. If the plural of man is always called men, why shouldn't the plural of pan be pen? If I spoke of my foot and I show you my feet, if I give you a boot, a pair should be beat. If one is a tooth and the whole set of teeth, why isn't the plural of booth be beef? Then one would be that and three would be those, yet hat in the plural would never be hose, and plural of cat would never be coes. We speak of a brother and also of brethren, but though we say mother, we never say metherin. So plurals in English, I think you'll agree, are indeed very tricky, singularly. <laughs> so this mix 
then took place. Now, two letters we've got to look at. The letter G and the letter V. Now, the Swedes, right, they pronounce the letter G as both G and Y. If you ask a Swede today to pronounce Gothenburg, they'll pronounce it as Jøtebry. A place in northern Denmark, Jutland, is a place S-K-A-G-E-N. Skagen, not Skagen, Skagen. And that's why we've got lots of words in the English language today with a G in being pronounced as a Y. Sign, fight, Queen's reign, number eight, 18, there's lots and lots of words with a G in being pronounced as a Y. The V, right, would be pronounced as a W. Now the W is peculiar to the English and the Welsh. You won't find a W in any other European language. They've got a double V. So in the French it's R-S-T-U-V-W-V. Not R-S-T-U-V-W-U, it's R-S-T-W-V. We are W. We put two U's together side by side and made the W. Over on the continent they put two V's side by side and made it a double V. So we've got a letter W that they haven't got and they've got a letter double V which we haven't got. What makes it a little bit difficult as we the English write down the W as a double V and call it a W. <laughs> but that's why Arsene Wenger was in charge of Arsenal Football Club and not Arsene Wenger. And it's why the Germans will say where are you going and what are you doing because they're seeing that W as a double V. So that's when the Angles came over. It was written down as Gipperswick. Right, but later the Normans saw a G and it became Gipperswick. But the Angles pronounced it as Ypsich. So that's why you've got Gipperswick Park and it's also called Ipswich and a river gipping and not a river yipping. So the two have mixed in together there. Going back to these Vikings, we've got lots and lots of Old Norse words in the English language. Anger, bag, bylaw, cake, freckle, husband, omsbudman, there, them, they, ugly, wrong, all are Old Norse based words. So you can see they've had a massive influence on the English language. And because Suffolk became part of the Dane law, right, because there was a big fight between the Angles, or the, and that's when, that's when the word English came in. King Alfred of Wessex, right, led some troops against the Danes. Now, the most of his troops were Angles, so he collared the phrase Anglish also to distinguish himself from his cousins over in Europe, in Saxony. So he called it Anglish, and that's where, because that was the vast majority of his troops. And then, after a battle, he pushed the Danes back, because the Danes had got all the way down to Somerset, pushed them back, and the Dane law, the line was drawn from the Essex side of London, zigzagged across to the River Mersey. Everything north of that was Danish controlled, everything south of that was English controlled. Well, included Suffolk, didn't it? The Dane law, right? Except North Northumbria, that stayed English. All right. And we've got place names in Suffolk with Old Norse roots. Ashby, it's farmstead settlement by the ash trees. Minsmere, pool by the mouth of the river. Ike, oak tree. Risby, farmstead settlement by the brush. All the Thorpes are Old Norse words. It means a secondary settlement to a main settlement. And then Westthorpe, Old Norse, Vesterthorpe, is a secondary settlement to the west. And then you've got Lowestoft, so you've got a Viking called Flover, and Toft means a settlement. So it's a settlement belonging to Flover, so it becomes Thlovestoft, which becomes Lowestoft. Summerladen and Summerton is Summerlithy, a farmstead settlement belonging to a summer raider. So the Tom bit is Anglo-Saxon or Old English, but summer lithy means um, the summer raider, a pirate, a Viking. And then some old Scandinavians, they owned land and they took over from existing English. So you get the Builder of Bilderston, the Carl of Carlton, the Drenger of Drinkston and the Flicker of Flixton all Scandinavians. So you can see it's a big, big influence. And I've got a few examples of old Scandinavian words in English, in the uh, Suffolk dialect. 
And these words I've taken from Suffolk dialect by A.O.D. Claxton, 1968. Dag. There was a heavy dag this morning. The dew. Dag. And the Swedish word today is dag. Ding. To throw or hurl. Dinge. To rain mistily and drizzle. Flacking. Flapping loosely like a clothesline. Right? Grup. That's an open channel carrying the water off a, a road into the ditch. Grop is the Old Norse. Hake, a hook in the fireplace. Um, Halva, for a holly tree. The Old Norse is Halfa. Lum. Um, marum, mat grass or seaweed on the shore. Old Norse, it's Marum. I know. Um, Ranny, for a shrew. Old Norse, for a long nose. Ranny, and a shrew's got a long nose. A rove, or rove, depending on what part we suffer from, is a scab that's not quite healed. That comes from Old Norwegian, rover. So, to sarnik, to dawdle up the hill, isarnik up the hill, comes from sanka, which is Old Norse. Strup, for the, for the windpipe. Swedish today, it's strup. So you can see the links are there. And... When the Normans arrived, they introduced the system of hereditary surnames. Now, up until that point, the English, which is now a mix of Anglo-Saxon plus Old Norse, as we've just proven, so the English had either Old Norse nicknames or Old Anglo-Saxon nicknames and by names, trade names and the like. They then adopted them as surnames. They didn't take on Norman surnames, they adopted their own nicknames as surnames because it was beneficial when they were writing their wills. And so some of the old English surnames, all the surnames ending in cock, means son of. Cock is the old Anglo-Saxon word for son of. Cock in Anglo-Saxon times referred to a male part of the anatomy, but it was an ordinary word. It only became a taboo word and a rude, vulgar word in the 1700s. So it'd be quite easy to say foot, knee, cock, chest, head, and nobody would know any different. And they wouldn't even snigger or smile because it was just an ordinary word. And they also called their sons cock. So instead of being Peterson, it was Peacock. Instead of being Adam's son, it was Adcock. You then have Alecock. Now that is a trade name. That means somebody who made beer taps, because cock meant tap, and that's why it referred to, so it makes sense, doesn't it? Yes. So when a baby was born, the first thing they looked for, because a male heir was important, was the little tap. 75% of Suffolk surnames, because I give talks on surnames, 75% of the audiences I have, have Anglo-Saxon or Old Norse-based um, surnames. Today, they're still there. See? So surnames are over a thousand years old. So we can see that the English language has now formed. The structure of the English language has formed too. And before the Normans arrived, the structure of the English language is the same then as it is now. So Harold at Hastings, Henry V at Agincourt, Winston Churchill in his wartime speeches, Boris Johnson trying to get us out of Covid, all use the same structure language right what we have done since then is add words from around the world the normans left the english language alone it was the language of the conquered it was the language of the peasant it was the language of the uneducated and they left it alone thank goodness but we the english because the sheriffs the barons the large landowners the king's aristocracy because they were norman right we took words from them and added it in to the english language and the hundred most common words in the english language today 93 are anglo-saxon four are old norse and three are norman french so i'm going to go early old english late old english and what i said earlier you'll be able to interpret. So early old English. Gestern day, they'd weather was good. Today, I storm up our rest mid Regen and Hegelshaw. We hidden under them haywagon. Now what we're gonna do 
let's change the G to a Y sound and we're going to change the V to a W sound. The only word we won't change is goad. So, gestern dag they'd weather ways goat. Yestern day the weather ways good. Yesterday the weather was good. Today storm up Arras with a Reagan and Hegel show. Today storm up Arras arose amid a rain and hail shower. Today a storm arose amid a rain and a hail shower. We hidden under them hay wagon. We hidden under them hay wagon or we hidden under them hay wain. Now, what you can't do with all these words we've taken from around the world is string them together and make a sentence. There's 600,000 words in the Oxford English Dictionary today. We have taken words from around the world and added it in. We've taken from the Normans, roughly 10,000. We, during the Renaissance period in Elizabethan times, we took roughly 10,000 words from the Italians, which were either Latin-based, Greek-based or Arabic-based. We made up lots of words in the, in, the, in the Elizabethan period during the Renaissance. Shakespeare made over 1,500, I think it was 1,720 words. He made up that are now in the English language, most of them, right? Others fell by the wayside. But I can speak to you using nothing but old English words. Well, well I'll do it now. This is all old English. I can speak to you with old English words and you will understand every word that I am saying. I'm not using any words from any other land or any other tongue and you can understand me. You can see the structure of the English language is there, can't you? The, the hundred most common words in the English language today are those structured, it's the structure. It's the words like the, of, and, a, to, that. So they are the simple words, the structure, and because that structure is so simple, it's strong. And that's why we can take words from around the world and still keep adding it into that structure. So the structure of the English language has not changed from 1065 to the present day. The pronunciations have changed, the spellings have changed, but the structure hasn't. And that's why, thank goodness, we've never ever had an official standard English. It's never, it's unofficial. And that's why Shakespeare could make up all those words, because we didn't have a structure. And yet, on the other hand, you had King James's Bible, and because that was being translated from the ancient Greek, Latin and Hebrew, that, which were structured languages, that is very structured. So on the one hand, you had James's Bible. On the other hand, you had Shakespeare making up words. Nouns became verbs, verbs became nouns, pluses make up words. <laughs> And so you had the two running side by side. We even do it today. And we can do this, whereas the French can't. Because of Académie Française, it's a very strict language. And in 200 years' time, there'll be an ancient French and a modern French. Ancient French, as per Académie Française, which was set up in the 1600s under Cardinal Richelieu, and modern French, which people are going to speak. So we get two days at the end of the week. And so we could, oh, we'll call that a weekend. But the French can't do that, so it's a weekend. We now put a camera and we hold it and we smile and we call it a selfie. The French can't do that, so it's le selfie. And Academy France says, no, 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 you can't do that, we've got to keep it. So eventually that will split. Where you've had strict lines and straight jacketed languages, Latin, ancient Greek, and French going that way, to, they die because they can't move with the times. But English, because we've never ever had that official standard, it was made up unofficially in the late 1700s, standard English and standard spelling. And that's why we can keep on moving with the times. It's a very, very rich language. And as I said before, we've got 600,000 words in the English language. That's twice as many as any other language you can't mention. Twice as many as the French and much more than any other language. So we have a rich vocabulary. We can have 10 ways of saying this, 10 ways of saying that six ways of describing that, 15 ways of saying this, and that's why our playwrights and our authors right, are revered around the world. Chaucer, Agatha Christie, Shakespeare, they are translated all around the world. All our great authors are. The English language is so rich, there's not another language like it. It's the best language in the world, and it's the greatest gift we've ever given the world.
Why are there so many dialects in England? Good question, and I get this asked quite a lot. Right, we've had a mixture of people coming in. The Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes, and the Frisians. They all spoke the same languages, but different dialects. Right, so the Jutes are in Kent, South Coast, Isle of Wight, Hampshire. The Saxons, Essex, Middlesex, Wessex, and Sudsex. The East Angles, they had one dialect. Then the Middle Angles had another dialect. Lindsay had another dialect. Mercia had another dialect. And Northumbria had another dialect. Now, within those, they would have their own dialects within those particular kingdoms as well. When the Normans arrived, right, the language of the Normans, well, it was Norman French, but a third of his army were Flemings. Because he had married Matilda of Flanders, right, a third of his army were Flemings. And they spoke the same language as this Anglo-Saxon Old Norse mix, but once again a different dialect. And after the conquest he said, thank you Flemings, I'm going to give you a big piece of land. And one of the big pieces of land was in West Suffolk, Flemton. That's where it gets its name from, right? For, with the land of the Flemings, right? Also, the Norman French was heavily Germanic because France had been controlled by the Franks. That's how France gets its name. But in 905, Rollo, a Viking, comes down, and these are the Northmen, the Norsemen, Normen, and they come down and they settle in northern France and take over an area of land which was named after them, Normandy, the land of the Normans, the Norsemen. So when they came over, so whilst it was Norman French, it was heavily Germanic, but also they had lots of Old Norse names and nicknames and words in their... So when they came over, a third of the army would call him Wilhelm, a third would call him William, and another third would call him Guillaume. So there was quite a mixture of, of people coming over. Then later on, we, the English, especially in East Anglia, especially in Suffolk, decided to invite the Dutch over. This was in the 1700s, to help irrigate the land and drain the land. And we took a number of Dutch words in from, from them. One in Suffolk is crinkle crankle for the walls. It's a windy wall. And crinkle crankle comes from the old English and old Dutch. Crinkle meaning windy and crankle is old Dutch for windy. So crinkle crankle. Right. So it's all adding up, isn't it? It really is. So we also brought in the, the Flemish weavers. Right, especially in Suffolk and in Norfolk. They spoke a Germanic tongue, once again, similar to the English, right, although a little bit more distant now, and they had an effect on the language. They brought the oo sound in with them, so that's why you'll have tribunal and museum and Tudors and Stuarts rather than Tudors and Stuarts and museum and the like. So they brought the oo sound in. So if we look at, so if all these people are coming in, but they didn't settle uniformly across the country. So if you look at Suffolk as a cake mix, it would be, and I've done this metric, right, 2.5 kilograms Angle, 700 grams Dane, 700 grams Celtic Britain, because the Britain, some Britons stayed behind. And as I said before, the Britons became strangers in their own country who were known as Waylish. So people who stayed behind, the Britons who stayed behind, so Ham, Hamlet, belonging to the Britons would be Walesham, becomes Walsham, and you get Walton. And so they were areas where the Britons stayed behind. 200, so this is still Suffolk, 200 grams Saxon, 200 grams Norman, one tablespoon of Frisians, two tablespoonful of Flemings, one teaspoon of Bretons, one pinch of Dutch and one jute beaten and whisked vigorously. <laughs> so that's my Suffolk cake mix. Now, if you go into Norfolk, you're going to get a bit more Angle, a bit more Dane, less Saxon, right? And that's why the Norfolk dialect is a little bit different to ours. You go into Essex and you can swap the Angles and Saxons around. So instead of being 2.5 kilograms Angle and 200 grams Saxon, 
you can swap that around. So it's 2.5 kilograms Saxon and 200 grams Angle. Right? And you'll be have less on the Dane. So once again, their accent is going to be different. You go up to the northeast, and it's now mainly Old Norse, Viking, and Angle, and less on everything else. You go to the West Country, and it's mainly Saxon and Old British, Brythonic, right, and less on everything else. You go to the Midlands, and it's more of an even mix to what it is in the Suffolk cake mix, but they wouldn't have the Frisians, and they wouldn't have the Flemings. So you can see every county has got... So if you're making a cake and you keep the ingredients the same, but you think, oh, I'll put an extra egg in there, not so much demerara sugar in there, a bit more plain flour there, and a bit more of this and a bit less... Although you kept the ingredients the same, because you've changed the amounts, you're getting up with a different cake. Well, that's the same with the Suffolk cake mix of what I've just said. We've kept the ingredients practically the same, but we've changed the amounts. And that's why every county has got its own dialect.